Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're at kind of a unique event here in New York City. There's a bunch of uh, Korean tech startups meeting here at Pier 17 in the big city. And what we're going to be doing is taking a look at what these startups are doing. And a lot of the things that we're going to see today are not things you can buy directly, but are things that go into things that you do buy, like cars and other sorts of products. And it's just kind of interesting to see all the technology that is coming out of Korea. This event is called Korea US SMEs Go Together. And we'll be going around to a couple of booths here to see what everything is all about. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that the organizers of this event did pay our travel expenses to come here and they're sponsoring the video. I just wanted to make that clear up front, but they are not controlling any of the content that we're making today and all of the editorial decisions that we're doing are our own and they are not reviewing or approving this before it gets uploaded. So let's head on in and see what we can find here at this startup event. Now, the way they've structured this event is having a couple of larger companies showcase some of the investments that they're making. And Hyundai is here with a few companies that are doing things that interact with their business, but also in other areas, too. Let's have a look inside. Now, this first stop at the Hyundai booth is Makino Rocks. They are an AI company. And what they're doing is focusing their AI technology on industrial systems for the most part. And so, for example, they have a... AI system that detects anomalies in laser drillers. And why this kind of thing is important for Hyundai is that Hyundai has a lot of robots that they use to make cars. And if one of the robots is developing a condition that would lead to it not working, to know those things before they happen is something that I think could be very valuable to a company like that, where one robot down can mess up the entire production line for a vehicle. But they're also doing some other things like trying to predict how to best run a cooling system in an electric car because EVs efficiency is really key for all aspects of the vehicle and rather than just having a negative feedback loop where you turn the thermostat down after you hit a certain threshold if you're able to keep the temperature within thresholds without having to go over or under things will be a lot more efficient from the energy consumption side and that's what this company is doing now we're looking at a car seat and this looks like it might be any leather seat you might find in a vehicle it feels like leather as I'm playing around with it here but this is not leather this is not plastic this is a leather that is made from mycelium fungi and this company is called Mycel, and they are making fungi based leather and they found that the fungi actually grows and interconnects very similar to how animal tissue interconnects and they can make these synthetic leathers that really feel quite close to the real thing and they have some examples down here if Jake can pull in a little closer so you can see some of the texture on them here. Really cool stuff. And in addition to making seats for cars, they are working on ways to make food as well because that texture for leather is also very similar to how a meat might feel. And they can, of course, adjust the taste based on uh, some of their research into biotechnology. And what's neat about this is we're always hearing about people growing lab meat you know, trying to use cells from an animal to grow meat. But here's an example of growing meat that's not meat, but is actually made out of fungi in a way that is probably more realistic to build at scale right now. And they've got a lot of plans for building out these massive mycelium growth areas where they can kind of pump out these leather seats on a much uh, greater basis than perhaps other uh, types of animal substitutes might be able to be grown. Now, this is a company called Mobile Tech, and you can see why Hyundai might be interested in what they're up to. What they have is a LiDAR system here. And this is an example of what one of these looks like. And what these do is build these 3D point maps of a particular location or a city street. And they're able to map those things out into uh, essentially something you can interact with in this case. So this kind of looks like uh, Grand Theft Auto 6 here, but this is actually uh, something that they were able to map of a Korean landmark. This is the Blue House, the former presidential palace that was open to the public recently. And they were able to very quickly build this model because they had this LIDAR data and photographic data that could build this out without having to spend a lot of time rendering it manually from scratch. And what they're really after here, though, is to find use cases for things like self-driving. And if my friend here can switch over real quick to the 
uh, street map. Can we do the street map real quick? Um, you can see some of the more practical use cases for this technology. So this is something that uh, they are running throughout portions of Seoul, and they've mapped these streets so that AI self-driving systems, like we were seeing uh, at another booth, can uh, basically train themselves in a virtual environment with all of the dimensions and, uh, and all of the things uh, in place as they currently are. Because, of course, uh, construction's going on all the time, and they're working on things, and buildings change, and landscapes change, and this is something that can very rapidly uh, be updated so that these systems can know what to expect when they're on the real road. So I've been driving an electric car now for about 12 years, and I'm on my third or fourth car at this point. And you don't often think about what happens to the batteries over a long period of time. This company called Poen is trying to make the most out of older battery packs and trying to avoid throwing everything out when only one or two components might be at fault. Let me show you what they've got demoed here. So uh, this is kind of a representation of a vehicle battery pack. And inside the vehicle, you've got these banks of batteries that are represented here. Now, what this really looks like, just to show you the full size of it, is something like this big pack here. And normally in a vehicle, it would tell you that one of these packs needs to get taken out and replaced. But there might actually be good cells inside of this. So what this company does is try to figure out a way to troubleshoot what is going on in the pack, replace the parts that are bad, get this pack installed back in the vehicle, and then if there are some batteries that are still useful, you can repurpose those batteries for other functions. So for example, you could take some of those little battery cells and put them into a little scooter that they have on display here, which is, being used, which is using older vehicle batteries that are still perfectly functional for a scooter, but can't uh, work well in a vehicle battery pack any longer. And if the battery can't be fixed, there is another life waiting for it. They can grind it up, separate out all the components, like the cathode and anode materials here, the copper and aluminum, and the black powder, which consists of a whole bunch of other stuff, and they can make new batteries from the guts of dead ones. And what they're trying to do is kind of reduce the, the waste that comes out of an electric vehicle battery pack that fails. And rather than throwing the whole thing out, you can fix what's broken, recycle what is broken, and reuse parts of the battery that might work well in another application. So here's a familiar logo, Google Play. There are a number of Korean app developers here, and you've got kind of the mix that you would expect from a booth like this one. There's a couple of different games that are gaining some popularity throughout the world. The one that I found most interesting is the one behind me here called Tiuda, which is a language app that helps you learn the Korean language. It uses video along with some AI listening to make sure that you're pronouncing things properly. And to some extent, it's almost old school in that it's got kind of like the CD-ROM video kind of thing that you might have seen in the 90s. But the app is listening to your pronunciation. And if you pronounce it correctly, that's when the video progresses to the next word to learn. And I really liked how engaging it is because you're looking at somebody on a phone like you might be uh, in conversation. Now, there's more to this show than just the tech part. We're covering the tech part, of course. We've got food here, some really interesting Korean goodies you can pick up, including some uh, Pokemon uh, Korean cookies that my daughters might like because they love cookies and they love Pokemon. That's a great combination there. And there's also other things like beauty. So if Jake pans to his uh, left there a little bit, you can see some of those products as well. So there's a lot of things on display here trying to uh, connect some of these Korean brands to the U.S. market. Upstairs on the roof, they've got a K-pop concert going on. We went up there a few minutes ago. There wasn't a uh, performance happening, but you can see they've got a pretty substantial stage set up there. So this is a pretty big event here beyond uh, just the tech stuff that we're looking at. All right, so this booth is called Naver Cloud, and you may not have heard of Naver before, but in Korea, they are as big as Google. They are the leading search engine, and cloud is their cloud product, very similar to how Google and Amazon and others here in the U.S. provide cloud services. And here there was something I thought was really cool because I can actually see what I've been hearing about, which is how these AI systems get trained for full self-driving cars. And if Jake uh, pans over here, we've got this widescreen monitor with some data coming from an actual vehicle experience with a LiDAR system. And this is kind of like a recording being played back. And so right now this vehicle is stopped. It looks like it's at a stoplight. 
but you can see now it's starting to move and they've now replicated kind of a simulation of what this vehicle is experiencing with what looks like a video game, but it's actually uh, the self-driving system training itself based on real-world data that it's encountered from that LiDAR there. And you can see the steering wheel turning much like a self-driving car would turn. And what's neat about this is that you can practice different scenarios with this car encountering things without actually hurting anybody or damaging property. So if you wanted to see what might happen if a kid runs out in front of the car, you can simulate that here and you're able to work with real data that's coming in from an actual car driving on that actual road. Now you might be wondering why this car keeps stopping at bus stops and that's because this data came off of a bus and the portion of the city that's being modeled here is a, a area of Seoul, Korea where uh, they allow autonomous vehicles to operate and so what you're seeing is a recreation based on real data of this bus doing its route. Now if you're driving a car or a bus you got to go over bridges and overpasses and who inspects that stuff? Well right now people do but you need to make that process perhaps more efficient and you can do that of course with a drone and this is the Argosdyne drone and it combines standard drone technology with a bunch of artificial intelligence and basically what happens here is that somebody rolls up with the drone on wheels here uh, they point it at a bridge, they tell it what they want it to look at on the bridge, and the drone will follow a flight path to look at columns and girders and all the things that might crack or fail on a bridge and report back what it found to the operator. And they've got a little demo running here on their video screen to show how this works. And this drone can operate autonomously because a lot of times when you're underneath a bridge like this, you may have interruptions in GPS and radio signals, so it is autonomously flying with AI and also using AI to find things that it might want to alert the uh, engineer to that need to be addressed. And what was neat about this is that the base station that it rolls in on has a charging pad. So when the drone lands on the pad, it will start charging in between flights here. So presumably they have some larger battery uh, stored inside of the vehicle here to keep it operating over longer periods of time. So we're visiting a company called Future Main with their product EXRBM. And this is an augmented reality training and maintenance system for industrial products. And my friend here is interacting with a HoloLens 2. And although it looks like she's in the middle of a science fiction movie here, she's actually pulling up very useful information about a machine that's broken and she's getting training on the spot as to how to fix it. So she's able to look at maintenance records of the machine. She's able to look at what the machine has uh, at fault and looking at what parts she might need to repair the machine. And what they told me earlier, this is kind of a combination of having a lot of data and history about how certain machines work in addition to being able to predict when things might break and also uh, having the information about how to fix the machine. And they've built very detailed models of these things so that when you interact with it virtually, in this case with a HoloLens 2, when you get on site, you'll kind of know what you're looking at because you've seen it in three, dimensionals, three dimensions before. And they also have other ways of augmenting a real space. They allow you to use tablets as well, and you can look at perhaps where hazardous fluids are flowing through a pipe so you know not to touch it, and that sort of thing as well. So kind of a full end-to-end -end solution. I was really impressed with the HoloLens too. I hadn't played with one before until today, and it has a much wider field of view. The image quality is much better than before, and it's pretty comfortable to wear as well. I could see people wearing these things for long periods of time comfortably to be able to troubleshoot these uh, machine problems that they might be encountering. Now what you're looking at here are some plastic products from a company called Green Whale Global. And while these look like regular mundane plastic products, they're actually made from a plastic that will completely break down in a garbage can or a landfill or even in your backyard because it is made out of uh, tapioca starch and sugar cane or corn. And that mixture and the process that they apply to it allows this stuff to function like plastic and actually work in existing plastic manufacturing yet can break down a lot better than existing plastics do. These cost a little more than regular plastic but they're less than other plastic alternatives 
and you can even use it in a 3D printer like we're seeing here with this uh, dragon-like uh, creature that they printed off of a off-the-shelf 3D printer. They're also making materials for masks and disposable clothing. All of the types of plastic products we have today work with this. The one weak point right now is heat and water, so it may not work well for hot food takeout yet, but for cold items it should be fine, and because of the materials being used, it is completely food safe. In fact, you might be able to eat it after you're done eating the food in the container, but I would probably advise against that. Now, the pairing of these small companies with large Korean companies is a strategy that the event's organizer tells me is something they hope to expand in the future. That's why we are, we are making like that program or support to help those like overseas startups. So by matching them with Korean companies and enterprises. So that's why I hope to make that event next time to show that the success stories of uh, like how we have worked with the foreign startups to help them to enter the Korean market well. So that's going to do it for our dispatch from this Korean startup event. What was most intriguing was how they were approaching the market differently than what you might see at a CES. There you'll see people trying to capture a huge market of drones or something more general. Here they're really focused on specific use cases for their technology and I think it's a very realistic place for them to be focusing on here initially. And of course, they're smart enough to also pair up with larger companies like Hyundai to help uh, give them some of the funding they need to get here, first of all, but also to continue developing their products. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below, and we'll do one of these, I'm sure, again in the near future. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.